Hello again and thank you for joining me for another of our meditations on the tabernacle. This is our second series. We're now looking at the responsibility of the Kohathites and today it's the third item, the candlestick. For our readings from the Word of God, firstly to the book of Numbers, chapter 3 verse 29. The families of the sons of Kohath shall pitch on the side of the tabernacle southward, verse 31. And their charge shall be the ark, and the table, and the candlestick, and the altars, and the vessels of the sanctuary wherewith they minister, and the hangings, and all the service thereof. For a further reading in Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 through to 40. And thou shalt make a candlestick of pure gold, of beaten work shall the candlestick be made, his shaft and his branches, his bowls, his knobs and his flowers shall be of the same. And six branches shall come out of the sides of it, three branches of the candlestick out of the one side, and three branches of the candlestick out of the other side. Three bowls made like unto almonds, with a knob and a flower in one branch, and three bowls made like almonds in the other branch, with a knob and a flower. So in the six branches that come out of the candlestick. And in the candlestick shall be four bowls made like unto almonds with their knobs and their flowers. And there shall be a knob under two branches of the same and a knob under two branches of the same and a knob under two branches of the same according to the six branches that proceed out of the candlestick. Their knobs and their branches shall be of the same all it shall be one beaten work of pure gold. And thou shalt make the seven lamps thereof, and they shall light the lamps thereof, that they may give light over against it. And the tongs thereof, and the snuff dishes thereof, shall be of pure gold. Of a talent of pure gold shall he make it, with all these vessels. And look, that thou make them after their pattern, which was showed thee in the mount. And as always, we know that God is pleased to bless to us the reading from his most precious word. Here then is our artist's impression of what the tabernacle may have looked like. All the images in this slideshow are from free Bible images. Two sets are being used throughout these studies and the authors are shown at the end of the presentation. Here then is a plan of the tabernacle. The area coloured blue is the holy place in which our candlestick is found. You'll see it pictures there and it's on the south side in the holy place. Here then is an artist's impression of what the lampstand might have looked like in the tabernacle. I'm calling it a lampstand. I know our King James Bible says a candlestick, but as you'll see from the picture there and from the description in Exodus chapter 25, we think of a candlestick today of some item that contains a place for candles to be placed. There were no candles here. Those bowls at the top of the lampstand were filled with olive oil and wicks were placed in them. And it was those wicks that were lit and would give light in the holy place. So you'll hear me refer to it as a lampstand rather than a candlestick. I would like to suggest to you that the picture from our artist there, whilst a beautiful picture, does not really portray the full intricacies of the lampstand details as given to us in Exodus chapter five that we read together. The details were very intricate and the fact that it was made of beaten work out of a pure sheet of gold is absolutely an amazing fact to think that such a item could be made. But that just goes to show how God used men and skilled them greatly to produce such wonderful pieces of tabernacle furniture. There are various things that were told about this item and there are a lot of things that were not told about the item. And one of the things that were not told is precisely its height, its breadth, what the base might have looked like, whether the central shaft came higher than the other branches, and where scripture is silent, I'm going to be silent too. You may see lots of pictures looking quite different to the one that I'm using, 
they might be right, this might be right, and we're not going to argue about it. What we are told about it is its weight. It was made of a talent of gold, not just gold, it was made of a talent of pure gold. There are some differing views about precisely how heavy a talent might have been. It's probably in the region of 75 pounds or 34 kilograms. If I was to tell you that based on current values of gold, that would amount to 1.5 million pounds, an immense sum. And we might stagger at the thought as to precisely how much the value of that gold is. But let's remember what the scripture says. And as we think of this pure gold, it reminds us of divine righteousness. It reminds us of divine holiness. It reminds us of the absolute deity of the Lord Jesus. And Colossians 2 verse 9 tells us of the Lord Jesus, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And clearly there is no earthly measure that can value or measure that. In previous studies, I've indicated that some of these tabernacle items would reflect beautifully the great I am statements of the Lord Jesus in John's Gospel. I didn't say in our last study, but when we thought of the table of showbread in the holy place, we could have thought of the great I am statement of the Lord Jesus in John chapter 6, verse 35, when he says, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. We also read in that chapter that the Lord Jesus spoke of himself as the true bread which came down from heaven, one who fully, totally satisfies. As to this lampstand, John chapter 8 verse 12 tells us of the Lord Jesus, I am the light of the world, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This lampstand was the only source of light in the tabernacle, just as our Lord Jesus is the only source of divine enlightenment to those that dwell in the darkness of sin. One of the key words in the Gospel of John would be that of light, and the other similar would be that of life. And remember that John tells us in his Gospel that as he was announced by his forerunner, John the Baptist, he said of the Lord Jesus that he was the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. As to the details that we do know, each of the six branches out of the central stem, three on each side, each of those branches had three buds, three flowers and three fruits. So that gives us nine on each branch and there were six branches giving a total of 54 ornaments in total. On the central stem, the numbers are slightly different. There are four of each, four buds, four flowers, and four fruits. And adding the 12 onto the 54 that we've seen already gives a total number of ornaments of 66. And your mind runs on away to think of the 66 books of the Bible. And that's a good way to think of these 66 items representing the complete full canon of scripture. 66 books, all God breathed, not one book too many, not one book short. Imagine what this lampstand would have looked like that if on one of the branches there was an extra set of ornaments, or if on another branch there was a set short, the whole thing would look obscure, out of place, the symmetry would be gone. And so it is with the Word of God we have every single book that we know and love to call the inspired word of God. As we think of buds, flowers and fruits, we can't help but be reminded of Aaron's rod. We looked at that as we thought of one of the items in that chest in the Ark of the Covenant. And Aaron's rod, we remember it budded it blossomed and it bore fruit. In the case of that rod, it vindicated the servant of God. 
And as we think of that rod with its buds and flowers and fruits, it reminds us of resurrection. It reminds us that the Lord Jesus went into death and he came out of death victorious and he now lives in the power of an endless life at the right hand of the throne of God. But you will remember, won't you, that 40 days after his resurrection, he ascended to heaven. And then 10 days later, we have the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Had the Lord Jesus remained in the grave, there would be no descent of the Holy Spirit. He spoke to his own in John's Gospel about the necessity of him going back to heaven. In John chapter 16, verse 7, he says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. That Comforter is none less than the Holy Spirit of God. He came 50 days after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus from the dead. And you know, as we think of these receptacles to hold the oil, these open bowls in the form of almonds at the top of each of the stems, they were there to hold the oil into which the wicks were placed. And that would be lit twice daily by the priests as they went into the holy place to administer things for God. The placing of the bread on the table, as we saw in our last study, the placing of incense upon the incense altar, which we will look at in our next study, and the lighting of these wicks of the lampstand. That oil, it was beaten olive oil, and it's a symbol to us of the Holy Spirit of God. We're told in the book of Numbers, chapter 8, verse 2, that the purpose of this lampstand was not only to give light in the holy place, and that it did, but it was also to bear light against itself. In other words, the lamps burning in this lampstand were actually to light up the lampstand itself. We've seen already 66 items of furniture on this lampstand. It represents to us the word of God. How, we might ask, are we to understand the word of God? We might think of them sometimes as deep things. Let me quote to you three verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 9 through to 11. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither hath it entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Isn't it a wonderful truth that the day you and I believed on the Lord Jesus for salvation, the Holy Spirit came to indwell us from that very moment, never to depart from us. Let me quote to you again from John chapter 14, verse 16. The Lord Jesus says, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you for ever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Dear fellow believer, we have a resource that the world hasn't got. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit who takes to the truth of God and reveals it to us. John 14 verse 26 But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said. Unto you. So in this lampstand so far we have seen something of the resurrection of Christ. We have seen something of the descent of the Holy Spirit. 
I wonder if there is any reference anywhere in this lampstand to the death of Christ. You will recall that in most of the things that we've looked at so far in our studies, we've seen reference to the death of Christ. There must be some reference in this lampstand, surely. Well, yes, there is. This gold was originally one solid sheet of gold and it was beaten with a hammer and made into this delightful piece of furniture in all its intricacies that we have seen in our study so far. The beating, truly a reference to the sufferings of Christ. This oil for the lamp, in each of those seven receptacles there was olive oil, pure olive oil, beaten olive oil. And again it reminds us of the sufferings of Christ. This is truly reflective of life out of death. I don't know whether you enjoy looking at Bible numbers, but let me just say one or two things about the numbers. We've thought of the groups of three, the three buds, flowers and fruits. Three in scripture represents full testimony. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established, Matthew 18 verse 16. And it is the Holy Spirit that gives full testimony to the person and work of the Lord Jesus. On the central stem we saw that there were four lots of three, and four represents that which is for the whole world. The four points of the compass, north, south, east and west, would tell us of that. And Christ, his person and work, is for the whole world. And it is the work of the Holy Spirit who has been sent into the world to convict the world of sin, righteousness and judgment to come. Seven branches, a central stem and six branches, seven in total, that which speaks of perfection, that which speaks of completeness, of fullness. There is one Holy Spirit and yet how wonderful it is to see that the one Holy Spirit has many facets to his work. I would suggest that some are possibly seen in the Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah chapter 11 verses 1 and 2. And I'll read that section for you. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Perhaps that central stem represents the overriding person of the spirit of the Lord. And then we have three couplets. The first, wisdom and understanding. The second, counsel and might. And the third, knowledge and the fear of the Lord. That would be a separate study in its own right to think of those. I'll leave you to meditate upon them. To conclude, we've seen one great I am statement of John chapter 8 verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Can I suggest there's a second here? As we've just thought of this seven branched lampstand, do you not see the form of a central stem and branches coming out of it? Am I possibly leading you to think of John chapter 15, where the Lord Jesus says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. On a practical note, we see our importance of abiding in Christ. We are lifeless, we are useless. We are fruitless unless we abide in Christ. Are we going to have an effective testimony in a dark world? After all, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 2 verse 15 and exhorted them to be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. But then notice what he says, among whom ye shine as lights in the world holding forth the word of life. And I close now with the words of Matthew 5 verse 16 from the Sermon on the Mount. 
says the Lord Jesus, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Finally, this final slide to show that the images used in this presentation are from free Bible images. As I've indicated earlier, two sets are used and the two authors are shown there. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Pray that you might know the Lord's blessing as together we seek to serve the Lord Christ in a dark world, holding forth the word of life. Until next time, every blessing in him.